выключите мобильные телефоны, потому что их не звук мешает выступлению сэра Пенроуза. Второе. Ни в коем случае во время выступления, если вы будете фотографировать, не пользоваться вспышками. Это тоже его очень сильно отвлекает. И третье. Если вы не пользуетесь наушниками, наушниками, то или их выключите из розетки. Вот здесь есть бок, у каждого пульта розетка. Потому что наушники, когда включены, дают фоновый звук, что тоже отвлекает и мешает. Или второй вариант. Есть регулировочный такой вот ролик, который можно свести на ноль, чтобы, так сказать, не было. Если вдруг вы слышите, где-то рядом лежат наушники, и от них идет фоновый, фоновый звук, просьба выключить, чтобы нам не мешал на, при нашей работе. И последнее. На прошлом выступлении кто-то забыл очки свои. Может быть, кто-то присутствует в зале или знает, кто это забыл. Вот они тут есть, и, соответственно, мы готовы вернуть владельцам эти очки. Спасибо. Мы начинаем сегодняшнее мероприятие. Сегодня с докладом, с выступлением достаточно большим выступит сэр Роджер Пенроуз. И я хотел бы, чтобы мы его поприветствовали. Considerably with a talk I gave at the Polytechnical Museum on Monday, but there will be some more technicalities in this talk than there were there. So here we have a. Oh, I have to check this here. Which way up on it? This way. That way. Oh, that's It's upside down for me, but so if you see the picture upside down, remind me. So here we have the title, excuse me, Seeing Through the Big Bang into Another World, which is perhaps a somewhat outrageous title, but in a sense, I want to try and persuade you that this is what we are doing. Before coming to that, Let me describe the history of our universe as we understand it today. In my pictures, many of them, we have time going up the picture and space going horizontally. So this represents the Big Bang at the bottom, which is considered to be the origin of the universe in conventional cosmology. And as time progresses, we move up the picture, thinking of space as a slice through this space-time picture. You'll notice that I have this rather vague thing at the back. This is because I don't want to prejudice the issue with regard to whether the universe is spatially open or closed. It might be closed up at the back, or it may go on to infinity. Space may be infinite. That does not matter. In what I want to say, the universe could be spatially finite or spatially infinite. It does not affect my talk. Now, in this picture, there's one thing that you might consider is not represented, which is inflation, which is supposed to have taken place very early on. There are two reasons why I have, I have not drawn it in this picture. One of them is that, well, maybe I have drawn it in the picture, but you wouldn't see it because it would be tucked into that black spot and it would not affect the picture whatsoever. There is another reason which I'll come to shortly, which is that I don't really believe it. It is part of current cosmology that there was this inflationary stage in the early universe, and, sorry, there were some questions. In order to 
see what current cosmology says about inflation, we need a powerful magnifying glass. Well, this magnifying glass, I have drawn here what we might see. This is the handle of the magnifying glass, in case you're puzzled by that. This is the edge of it. And here we see the inflationary phase, which is supposed to have taken very, very early on, I don't know, about 10 to the minus 32 seconds or something, the very early stage of the universe, in order to explain certain things which are puzzling about the universe. I always had trouble with inflation because it seemed to me that many of the things it was supposed to explain, it did not explain. And I'll perhaps illustrate why I think that is a problem. I mean, it was in, <clears throat> supposed to in, explain why the universe is so uniform. But that is part of a much bigger problem, which is certainly not addressed by inflation, and I shall come to that. However, inflation does play important roles in certain observational features of cosmology. So if we don't have inflation, we need something else which will serve as well. Now, one of the most striking features of inflation, if it is there, is that it very much resembles the exponential expansion that we seem to have in the universe. Let me come back to that here. Notice that we have an initial expansion phase, and then we have an accelerated expansion later on, which is uh, a feature that was discovered in the late uh, 20th century and won the Nobel Prize, not this last time, but the time before. So it's obviously recognized as a fundamental observation about the universe, namely that it is indulging in this exponential expansion, at least as far as we can see at the moment. We are somewhere around about here in the picture, and the exponential expansion is just beginning to show itself. So uh, that does seem to be a feature of the universe. It seemed to have been puzzling to the people who first found it. Uh, however, this feature has been well known to cosmologists as a possibility ever since Einstein introduced his cosmological constant in 1917 for admittedly the wrong reason. He wanted to have they're trying to say well, slides are out of focus. Well, how do we deal with that? Yes. There is some mechanism, some device on here which will control the focus of somebody here. Or did it down here? It's because you have one slide superimposed on another. No, I haven't. Well, I was at one time, but this is not like that. <laughs> no, there is a focus. Someone will have to do that for me. It went out of focus, it was not. Yes, it was in focus, and then it went to the That was fine. Okay, very good, thank you. What do I press? Okay. Oh, it's that. Okay. Yeah. For some reason, it went out of focus. I have no idea why. Okay. That looks good. Uh, now I have to remember what I was talking about. <laughs> the, uh, the exponential expansion is consistent with Einstein's cosmological constant, thing which is called lambda, capital lambda, and that was uh, introduced because Einstein wanted to have a static universe. Now, uh, it turned out shortly afterwards that the observations seemed to indicate strongly that the universe was not static and was expanding, and so Einstein rather regretted having introduced the cosmological constant because if he had not done so, he might have predicted the expansion of the universe. However, the, expansion, the exponential expansion comes from the cosmological constant, or some other explanation which is often referred to as dark energy. However, the observations do seem to be completely consistent with it being due to a cosmological constant. And the cosmological constant, or lambda, has to have a small positive value, and that leads to an exponential expansion, unless the universe is closed and, and relatively small. 
but uh, even with a closed universe, uh, we would get this exponential expansion uh, if the universe is sufficiently large. Okay, so this does seem to be there, and it will play a key role in what I want to say. So I'm accepting the exponential expansion, and I'm accepting the Big Bang, but I'm not accepting necessarily the presence of the inflationary phase. But I did point out that the exponential expansion and the inflationary phase are, in some respects, very similar. So we might have another exponential expansion, which is what I want to talk about, which plays the role of inflation, but it occurred not after the Big Bang, but in a certain sense before it. But how could it be before it if the Big Bang was the beginning? Now, the idea of an inflationary phase of some sort, which was before the Big Bang, was actually introduced by the uh, well-known Italian physicist Veneziano, and uh, his model has certain things in common with what, what I want to say, but mine is different. His depended on string ideas from string theory. My model has no contribution from string theory that is, does not feature at all in what I want to say. Now, in order to understand the model, I want to introduce two mathematical tricks. Think of these as just pieces of mathematics, which are useful and, for the moment, have no particular physical role to play. One of them is to squash infinity down so that infinity becomes a finite boundary. We do this by means of a conformal map. And just to show you the idea of what I'm trying to do here, we can use this well-known print due to the Dutch artist M.C. Escher. Uh, this is, in fact, a model of hyperbolic geometry, or Lobachevsky geometry. And this geometry, you can represent the entire plane, the entire hyperbolic plane, within this circular boundary. This is a representation, representation due to Beltrami, an uh, uh, Italian geometer, later rediscovered by Poincaré. It is sometimes referred to as the Poincaré disk, but Beltrami actually had all the well-known representations, not just this one, but several others as well. A uh, very elegant way of representing the hyperbolic plane. Now, the key point I want to make here is that this representation is a conformal one. That means that although sizes, you have to see that the, these fish-like creatures, as you go nearer to the edge, have to be regarded as being actually congruent or the same as the ones in the middle. It's just that the representation squashes them down so that they appear to us to be smaller. But the transformation, which represents these figures on the Euclidean plane, is a conformal one. So it preserves angles. If you look at the angle here on the wing or the fin of the fish, that angle is correctly represented no matter how close to the edge you are. Moreover, if you take the eyes of the fish, which are circular, they remain circular no matter how close you get to the boundary. This transformation preserves small shapes, but it does not preserve sizes. So you have to think that shape is, at least infinitesimally, preserved in the conformal map, yet the scale of size can be different. And so this enables us to represent the entire hyperbolic plane right out to infinity as a finite region with a smooth, finite boundary. There is a version of this representation also in three dimensions, where you simply take the sphere, and the in inside of that sphere, interior of the sphere, is the entire hyperbolic three space. Now, it is this kind of transformation which enables us in space-time to squash infinity down to become this finite boundary here. But I'm also adopting the kind of inverse procedure to the Big Bang and expanding it out to be a smooth conformal boundary also. So those are just two mathematical tricks. 
to represent in a nice finite way both the infinite future and the singular infinitely compressed Big Bang as finite regions. And this is very useful if you want to analyze both these ends in a mathematical way. Now, what is unusual about the model which I am describing here is that I take these all so seriously physically. And how I, why I can do that, I'll come to later. But the idea will be that this history of the universe, but without inflation, is one eon, I'm calling this an eon, A-E-O-N, one eon of an indefinite continuation, both into the past and the future, of eons. So these will be continue indefinitely in both directions. So there was an eon prior to our Big Bang, there will be another eon to the future of our Big Bang, and they all fit together in a smooth, conformal way. The conformal geometry will be smooth right across from each one to the next. So that is the picture. And what I want to do is try to justify that picture, both from motivations coming from observation and physics, and uh, also to make it more reasonable as a physical situation. Let me return to these two mathematical tricks for the moment and say something more about them. I said they're mathematical tricks. Uh, there is a logical distinction between these two uses of these mathematical tricks. The logical distinction is that in the case of the future, it works under very general circumstances. So there is a theorem due to Helmut Friedrich who showed essentially that this expansion is a very general thing to happen. You can take uh, models which are very irregular, if you like, and you still can do apply this trick. The trick is one which works under very general circumstances. However, there is a very different logical status to the other end of the trick, this one, which stretches the Big Bang out, it is an extremely strong restriction on the nature of the Big Bang. And I want to try and persuade you that we need an extremely strong restriction. This is an idea basically due to my colleague, Oxford colleague, Paul Todd, who formulated the restriction we need on the Big Bang in this particular way, which is a very elegant way of doing it. Now, I want to try and tell you, explain to you why we need such an enormous restriction on the Big Bang. In fact, it comes from one of the most basic and elementary principles, well, elementary is perhaps a misleading word, one of the most basic principles of physics, namely the second law of thermodynamics. And there is a big puzzle about the second law of, law of thermodynamics, which I want to address now. First of all, what is the most persuasive reason for believing that there was a Big Bang at all? Whether there are the reasons coming from the expansion of the universe, and if you extrapolate backwards, then the galaxies we know are all receding from us, and so they suddenly seem to be compressed into something very small in the early universe. And the equations of Einstein also tell you that there will be this singular state in the, in the beginning, that is to say your equations will break down and things become infinite, the densities become infinite, the curvatures become infinite, and so Einstein's equations will uh, give up at that point. So that is the singular initial bang's, Big Bang state, and we have some evidence for it from the expansion of the universe. But you might think that perhaps in the very early universe uh, something else happened. But there was some more direct evidence for the existence of the Big Bang, and the most direct evidence is this microwave background, the radiation, electromagnetic radiation coming to us from all directions in space. Now there are two very important properties of this microwave background, which I want to describe here, and they both play, these are both very basic properties, which both play an important role in, in the puzzle I want to address here. 
One of them is this spectrum of the uh, intensities for different frequencies. So here we have frequencies going this way and the intensity up. <coughs> and here we have uh, the, the, the continuous line here is the famous Planck curve. And we have a very close fit to the Planck curve. I imagine more recent, this is quite an old slide, and I expect the more recent uh, observations fit even better here. But you will notice here these error bars, these are these lines here. These vertical lines represent the error bars, but they're exaggerated by a factor of 500. So that even the very worst case down at the bottom here, if you shorten that line by a factor of 500, you'll find that it hugs that point to within the thickness of the incline. So the curve itself is an extremely accurate representation of the Planck curve. And this is the most precise Planck curve known in observational physics. So what does that tell us? Well, the Planck curve, which of course was the thing which started off quantum mechanics, but it uh, tells us that what we're looking at is thermal equilibrium. This is uh, calculated from the assumption that you have thermal equilibrium, and then you find that, uh, that you get the radiation in that particular curve here with, with the uh, Max Planck's um, e equals h nu formula, which tells you that the uh, emission and absorption of radiation is in these little parcels of energy, h nu. Where nu is the frequency. Uh, but the point here I'm making is that you're looking at thermal equilibrium. Now, thermal equilibrium is maximum entropy. And this is, if you think about it, a big paradox. Because as you go back in, into the early stages of the, of the universe, you have the second law of thermodynamics. The second law tells us that entropy is increasing, or the randomness is increasing as time progresses. And that also tells you that if you go back in time, the randomness must be decreasing, and so that the Big Bang must be a very small entropy, a very highly organized state. Thermal equilibrium represents the maximum entropy state. So is this not a paradox? Well, I've often puzzled why cosmologists do not worry about this more. I mean, some cosmologists, and most famously, the very distinguished American mathematical cosmologist, uh, R.C. Tolman, who did, in fact, very seriously consider the issue of um, how entropy fits in with cosmology. And he clearly came to the conclusion that you need something. It's not simply that the universe was small in the old states. I think some people perhaps vaguely think because in the Big Bang you had a very small universe, maybe there was not much room for entropy or something like that. But that's simply wrong. There is as much, there are many, as many degrees of freedom available in the early stages of the universe as there are in the late stages. And so the fact that the universe was physically small is no argument at all. The expansion of the universe, it, you can't say technically it's equilibrium because the universe is expanding. But it's, uh, it's uh, in a adiabatic situation, the entropy basically is, remains constant as the entropy increase, as the universe increases its scale. So uh, this is uh, not the explanation. So we have to look for a different explanation for the way in which the universe was special in the Big Bang. Now the point here is that what we're looking at is basically radiation. We're looking at electromagnetic radiation where the radiation and the matter was essentially, apart from the expansion, was essentially in equilibrium. And what you're not looking at is something else about the universe, <coughs> namely the gravitational degrees of freedom. Now, how do we address that? I should mention the second most important part, point about the microwave background that I want to appeal to, which is that it is very nearly uniform over the whole sky. In fact, if you correct for the Earth's motion, which gives you um, slightly warmer in the direction we move in and the slightly cooler in the direction we move away from, you correct for that, then you find uniformity over the whole sky.
to one part in about 100,000. So it's very, very uniform over the whole sky. Now what does that tell us? That tells us that the universe was very uniform in the early stages, and that uniformity, well, first of all, let's think about how we would um, consider, say, a gas in a box, and when you, in discussions of entropy, you might have a gas which is initially, say, walled off in one corner, you remove the boundaries, and then the gas spreads out uniformly over the box as the entropy increases. So this is a time increases, entropy increases. It's consistent with the second law. And again, we see a uniform distribution which is consistent with high entropy again. So you seem to have, as far as the material contents of the universe, something which ought to be high entropy. So how is that consistent with the second law? Well, you begin to see what the key to that is when we think of say, gravitating bodies. Now this is the box, which is, say, galactic scale, something huge, never mind. And these are now stars rather than molecules. And because they're gravitating, they attract each other, they will co condense into patches, and then ultimately you will have a black hole, which represents an enormous increase in the entropy. So here we have entropy increasing, and an increase in non-uniformity, whereas just as the material, the entropy increases, it inc increases the uniformity. So what we are seeing is a combination, perhaps, of these two pictures here, which as far as the material is concerned, it is very high entropy, whereas as far as gravity is concerned, it is very low entropy. So it's more a puzzle than a paradox. It's not a paradox because the entropy was indeed very low compared with what it might have been in the early stages, but it's very low in its one very special way, namely gravity, not anything else. So we need to have some understanding of why gravity was different from everything else in the early universe. Now often people will say, well, it's quantum gravity is needed to explain that what happens at the Big Bang or something, but putting the word quantum there does not help. You have to understand why gravity was different. Well, maybe quantum gravity is different from other kinds of gravity, other kinds of quantum theory, which was in a sense what I used to believe. Maybe I still believe that, in fact I do still believe it, but I don't think that's the answer to this problem. I'll come to that shortly. Before coming to that, though, let me say something about black holes, because they will play an important role in what I want to say. They do represent not just an increase in entropy, but an absolutely stupendous increase in entropy. In fact, the entropy at the present moment, I think people, when they found the cosmic microwave background, were surprised to find how high the entropy is in the microwave background. But that is nothing by comparison with the entropy in black holes. We, in our galaxy, have a black hole which seems to be about four million times the mass of the sun. And other galaxies have even bigger ones. And if you take such things into consideration, and if you use the Bekenstein-Hawking formula for the entropy in a black hole, you will find that that entropy utterly dominates any other entropy that we have in the universe. So the black holes, if we're considering the second law, they're obviously a very crucial factor. So what are black holes? Well, here I have a space-time picture of a black hole. There is some body collapsing, say a, a supermassive star or something, an overmassive star, and the picture is a space-time picture, time going up again, and uh, the key thing, of course, is the light cones, which I've drawn here, or the null cones, and so I should remind you what null cones are. It simply represents the conceptual way in which light will behave. If you have a point in space-time, then at every point there will be conceptually some cone, which represents what light would do if, it, if there were light there. It doesn't have to be any light there. But if there is light there, it would have to follow the, uh, the generators of this cone. Here is a spatial picture, which I can imagine we have a full three dimensions. Of course, for this picture, I need to throw one of the dimensions away. And I've only got two spatial dimensions represented. But you think as time progresses, if you like, you can take sections to this. And here is the initial explosion, if you like, here. There is the next 
this ring represents that sphere, this ring represents that sphere. And here we have a picture of special relativity where the cones are all uniformly arranged according to the geometry of Minkowski. And here we have general relativity, which resembles this, but the cones, as with the picture of the black hole, you will see that the cones are not uniformly arranged, and this is what you have in general relativity. But in each case, you have the rule that massive particles must have their world lines that are always within the cones. They have to be locally traveling less than the speed of light, which means that the world lines are within the cones. Light, a photon, the history of a photon, the world line of a photon, would be always tangential to the cones. And that applies whether it's special or general relativity. And that gives us a, uh, an understanding of how the horizon, which is where these light cones become, the outer boundary becomes a, a vertical in the picture, so that nothing inside that can escape. So here, here's your horizon, and anything within here cannot communicate to the outside world, because to do so you would have to send a signal which violates the causality at the boundary. In the center we have the singularity. Again, it's a place where the equations of Einstein go wrong, because curvatures go infinite, and the, we have to give up, unless we have some wonderful quantum gravity theory or something which tells us what to do. We don't have such a thing at the moment, so we have no way of extending the physics to include what goes on inside the black hole. Now, I must find my picture. Here we are. If we include the black hole singularities in our general picture here, we need to uh, put the singularities of the black holes on there. So you see we have black holes, one, so we have singularities, one in the past, and singularities which be in the future, well, not everybody's future, but if you happen to consider something unfortunate enough to have fallen in through the horizon, then that represents the future of the particles which come in here. So that this is the future to anything which falls inside. Now, in this picture, well, it used to be in the old days of the singularities, people would emphasize the similarity between the Big Bang and the singularities in black holes. They're both places where the Einstein equations give up. However, there is a very big difference in detail between the two, and that has to do with entropy. We have argued that the Big Bang is a very low entropy singularity, and the singularities in black holes are extremely high entropy singularities. And the distinction between the two can be understood in terms of the kinds of curvature which you use uh, in Einstein's theory. We can split the curvature tensor into two parts. One is the Ricci tensor, which describes the matter, energy, momentum, pressures, uh, and so on, of matter. And the Weyl curvature tensor, which is the what's left, each of them having 10 independent components. The Weyl curvature measures the gravitational degrees of freedom. The Ricci tensor measures, measures the source degrees of freedom. Now, the, you find that the Weyl curvature dominates and becomes completely wild. This, uh, I think, the analysis done by the Russian mathematical physicists, uh, Lipschitz, Kolotnikov, and Belinsky, uh, was a very good analysis of what seems to be happening in the general case of a singularity in a black hole. But it's something which does happen in the general case. You have a singularity and there seems to be no way of avoiding this, according to Einstein's theory. But I do want to emphasize that the singularities contain the key to the second law of thermodynamics. It's the low entropy in the beginning, which gives us our second law, because you have to start from a low entropy in order to have anywhere to go. So the entropy increases, 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 and in a black hole, it increases enormously to the, to the very high value that you get in it black hole singularity. Now this does have relevance to the issue of things like inflation. Why is the universe so uniform? Now, 
people, when they introduced inflation, uh, took the view that the uniformity of the universe has to be explained by something like this inflationary phase. But I want to try and convince you that that doesn't work. Well, it doesn't work as a full explanation anyway. It might be a component of the explanation. Because what I want you to imagine is that the universe is now contracting rather than expanding. Now, of course, if this is the solution of the equations, then this is also a solution of the equations because they work equally both ways in time. And that includes the equations when you put inflation in. So the inflaton field is symmetrical in time as are Einstein's equations. It's all symmetrical physics. Now, what I want to imagine in this picture that I slightly deform it, but in a microscopic way, not in a macroscopic way, so that the degree, so that if you look at the entropy in detail, it should be increasing in the future. You see, of course, in this picture here, the entropy is increasing this way, and you get the irregularities, and those irregularities uh, give, you, give you black holes. But if you consider the collapsing universe with the second law of thermodynamics as applied to gravity, then the irregularities will be increasing in the future direction. And you will get black holes forming, and these black holes, as the universe collapses inwards, will congeal into one horrendous mess of singularity at the end. So you will have a very high entropy singularity, which will occur in this future state here. Now, that is a much, much, much more probable situation than this. And how, more, how much more probable I will come to shortly. But let me just think of this picture. Now, that would be a much more likely beginning for the universe. Inflation or not, you can put the inflaton field in. It makes no difference in this discussion because it's time symmetrical. So why, you say, was the universe not like this? There is one point which perhaps I, I should mention and might worry people because in order for this to be a beginning, you might like to say, well, this has to be uh, a space-like initial state. Well, that is a feature of one of the things that we tend to believe about general relativity <coughs> called a strong cosmic censorship. That will tell us that this is space-like. In fact, there are many, many solutions where we can see explicitly it's space-like. If you take the uh, Lipschitz, Kalatnikov, Belinsky, again, it's space-like. So this, when I say it's space-like, that means that could, that could be an instantaneous event. So there's nothing, although I've drawn this picture looking very irregular at the beginning, that could be an instantaneous event, and that would be a far more likely beginning to the universe than the one we see, whether or not you put inflation in. It makes no difference. <clears throat> it makes difference, but it doesn't make any difference to the argument. So this is the puzzle. Why did we have that and not that as the beginning of our universe? Why was it gravitational degrees of freedom that was suppressed at the beginning and nothing else? That is the puzzle which has to be addressed and which, it seems to me, is uh, sadly not addressed uh, by most uh, cosmological models. Okay, Tolman did address it, but he didn't know the huge degree. I didn't know about black holes, and this really scales everything up to such an enormous degree that his particular discussion hardly touches the, the question of how special this Big Bang must have been. Okay, so here we have the issue of trying to address that beginning state. The Big Bang must have been subject to a huge constraint. And it is in the suppression of gravitational degrees of freedom. And if you bring in the bettenstein hawking formula to try to estimate, simply knowing that the black holes, or the time reverses of black holes, in other words, white holes, could easily have been there in the beginning, and if they had, that would have been, well, much, much, much more likely. And you can estimate by taking how much matter there is observed in the observable universe and see how big a black hole could have been there, or think how big a white hole there could have been there, and how much more likely that would have been than the universe that we see. Well, the unlikeliness of our universe coming about by chance is 
something like one part in 10 to the power, 10 to the power, 124. Well, I used to say 123, but the four is there because the dark matter is now well established, or if you don't believe in dark matter, it's only 10 to the 123, it's not 10 to the 123. That makes, well, it makes a huge difference mathematically, but no difference whatsoever with regard to the discussion. So this is an absolutely, fantastically large degree of specialness which seems to have to be explained. And inflationary arguments nowhere touch this. Okay. But <clears throat> um, now before we address the question of why, I want to try and address the question of what. What was it like? How do you describe mathematically what that state would have to have been like? Well, it's a thing that I've worked on for many years, and I've tried to uh, describe it by referring to what I call the vile curvature hypothesis. I mentioned the vile curvature a short while ago, describing the gravitational degrees of freedom. So it seemed to me, if you could say, in the early universe, if the vile curvature was zero or very small, that would be, uh, well, an explanation is too strong a word, but that would be a characterization of what the bang, Big Bang was like, and an explanation would be something coming later. But it's, it turns out to be somewhat awkward mathematically. It's awkward for a very simple reason. Um, the vile tensor is, after all, a tensor. And the tensor is something that needs a smooth space in order for it to be defined. And so if you say the vile tensor is zero at a place where you can't define the vile tensor, <clears throat> That's awkward. However, you can say that the uh, take limits and say we're using certain kinds of limiting procedures that the uh, vial tensor has to go to zero in some rate. So that's all right. Uh, however, there are all sorts of different ways you could phrase that, and it's not quite clear what the best way is. So it's rather wonderful that this vial curvature hypothesis can be rephrased in a way that has been put forward uh, very precisely by my colleague Paul Todd, initially in 2003, which is the proposal that the space-time be extended conformally, that's the light cone structure, is the conformal structure, I'll come a little bit to that in a minute, to before the Big Bang. That's exactly what I was saying in this earlier uh, picture, so let me come back to that, so that you can stretch out the big bang. And I said this was an, enorm an enormous constraint on the initial state, and this enormous constraint is the one that seems to be physically what one needs in order to have a big bang of a character that we find. So it's it's a constraint, enormous constraint, but it is just exactly of the kind we need in order to have the second law of thermodynamics in the form we have, namely with gravitational degrees of freedom suppressed, but the rest of the degrees of freedom not apparently being particularly suppressed. So that is the universe we see, and that kind of universe is explained by having this smooth, conformal extension to a boundary in the past. So that is the idea that Paul Todd put forward, and I'm accepting that. I think it is an excellent way of formulating the uh, bar curvature hypothesis. Technically, it does not give you a bar curvature which is zero. It gives you a bar curvature which is bounded. So it is a big condition on the bar curvature. It's not quite what I was saying when I said the bar curvature is zero. However, if you go further, and this is what I want to do shortly, to explain, you see, what, what does Paul Todd say? He says, you can expand the Big Bang out to a nice, smooth initial surface, and, well, is it just a mathematical trick, or is it something else? Well, let me come to that. So far, it's a mathematical trick, but the question is, is there some physics to that? that is of relevance here. Now, the point that I want to come to is 
what kind of geometry should we use for space-time? And I've already mentioned the light cones as being a crucial feature of space-time geometry. But the light cones are not everything. If you want to have the geometry that Einstein needs for his theory, you need a full metric, which is often written GAB or G, G mu or G whatever it is. GAB, GAIJ, G mu, something or other. This is a tensor quantity which has 10 components per point, 10 numbers per point. Now the ratios of those 10 numbers are simply nine numbers, and those nine numbers give you the light curve. So the picture that I was giving you before with the light cones here is just a conformal, but well, I should say that the light cones are the conformal geometry in space-time terms. They determine angles. They do not determine the scale of size, but they determine the conformal structure. The conformal structure is the light cone structure. We also want an orientation, so there is a plus and a minus cone. The plus cone represents the future. The past cone represents the past. So we still have a causality future and past are distinguished. However, we do not necessarily have a scale. Okay. Now, introducing the scale, you need a clock of some sort. And here I have clocks which measure time. And if you measure time, that automatically fixes distance. In fact, clocks are now very precise. We can have atomic and nuclear clocks. And these, their precision comes ultimately from these two very famous formulae, Einstein's E equals mc squared and Max Planck's E equals h nu, combined together, which tell you that if you have a particle of a well-defined mass, a stable particle, that particle has, is, is a clock. I think something went wrong with the... I must have touched something here. Can you hear me? Oh, it's all right. Is it? Okay. Is it okay? I wonder, I wonder whether I hit something. Okay. We have very precise clocks, but these ultimately depend upon the fact that elementary, basic stable particles are automatically clocks. By combining Einstein and Max Planck, you find that the mass of that particle determines the frequency, and here we have the formula here, <coughs> given by these two constants, C, speed of light, and H, Planck's constant. And it's the, the very precise atomic and nuclear clocks that we have come from, ultimately, from the rest masses of particles. Now that, in fact, gives us the metric of space-time. We know that a metric often you think of as distances. Well, the uh, meter rule in, in Paris is, uh, is now superseded by uh, measurements of time. <laughs> And even the meter itself is defined in terms of seconds. So uh, we don't need rulers anymore, but clocks will give us the scale. And here we have two clocks moving uh, with the same, uh, through the same point here. And these are the ticks of the clocks. And to know those ticks, you have to amend to this picture here the uh, metric structure, which is given by, by these things here. So here we have the hyperbolar surfaces here, which are uh, <coughs> giving you the, um, the scale that we have. So if it's here we have the geometry, which is conformal geometry. Here we have the metric geometry that Einstein needs for his theory. Many parts of physics only need conformal geometry. Maxwell's theory is conformally invariant, just needs the light cones. Also the strong and weak forces of nature those only need the conformal geometry. Also, the yang mills theory only needs conformal geometry, but there you do have massive particles which uh, are involved as well, and the massive particles is what give you the scale. So if you had no mass, you would just have this kind of geometry, the conformal geometry. If you have mass, then you have the full metric geometry that Einstein needs for general relativity. Now, I'm going to take the view that at, well, first of all, at the Big Bang, when you get to very close to the Big Bang, where temperatures are much larger than, say, the Higgs temperature, where the Higgs temperature, when the universe cools to the temperature where the Higgs mass comes in, then that 
is where particles begin to have mass in a meaningful way. If you have hotter than that, particles are effectively massless. So if they're massless, then it's the conformal geometry which is the relevant geometry. So that's what I'm saying. It's not just a mathematical trick. You can actually physically, that's what the universe is interested in. It's in the con interested in the conformal geometry. So you might say, well, maybe there was something prior to the Big Bang. Now, you might say that was a collapsing universe, but if it's a collapsing universe with entropy going in the same direction as here, then you have that great mess which I showed you before, and it certainly doesn't join on. So that doesn't work very well. So what I'm going to do is something very uh, different in a sense. I'm going to look at the remote future and see what that's likely to be like. So this is the remote future, if you like, up here. And that remote future, um, well, we have to know something about black holes, because I said this is where most of the entropy is. And uh, we know that black holes, according to Hawking, will radiate because they have a temperature. Now, you might ask, how big is that temperature? Well, the hottest black holes are the smallest black holes. And the smallest black holes we know about are just a few times the solar mass. And the temperature is very cold. You have to think in terms of something like the coldest temperature ever made in the laboratory on Earth. And that's sort of comparable with the temperature of these very uh, cold uh, black holes. However, those are the hottest black holes. And bigger black holes are still colder. And they're colder. We know now very, very large black holes are out there. And they're extremely cold. But when the universe expands to the ambient temperature being smaller than that of the black holes, then the black holes will be the hottest things around. They will radiate and gradually evaporate away all their mass until they disappear. Well, with, I put a pop here. That means an explosion, which is relatively small on the cosmological scale. Very, uh, nothing to, we don't know the physics here, but it doesn't seem to be a very big effect considering all the other things going on. How long will that take? Well, for the largest black holes that seem to be present in the universe, something of the general order of a Google years. Well, a Google is not a very scientific term. It means 10 to the power 100. So we may have to wait for our 10 to the power 100 years before the black holes disappear. But they will, ultimately, according to Hawking, and I'm accepting that also. So we have black holes evaporating away and the picture now is here. Not to scale, I'm afraid, now, but the black holes eventually disappear, and that's what I call the very boring era. It's pretty boring when you do have black holes. It's even more boring when they've gone. Uh, and I was worrying a bit about this at one stage and thinking how un unfortunate it is for our universe for it mostly to be in such a boring state. Well. Then I worried about who was going to be aboard by this universe, and it came to my mind that it's mostly photons, and photons have, don't experience the passage of time. So maybe it's not boring for a photon. So you see, if I go back to my picture here of the clocks, when you see a photon just goes along the light cone, it never even encounters its first tick. So a photon is never bored, it hits the future boundary of the universe without ever having uh, noticed anything. Well, that's uh, not a very scientific argument, but it did seem to me that it was, since I was used to these ideas, these mathematical tricks, thinking of the future as being represented as a finite boundary, which is what is relevant to the massless contents of the universe. So that was the picture that uh, um, seemed to me an appropriate picture for the remote future. You do have to worry about this to some degree. Okay, black holes will have gone. However, there will be particles. Okay, mostly photons, almost in terms of particle numbers, by far the most things will, around will be photons. But on the other hand, you might worry that for logical reasons you should include the odd electron and so on. And, okay, protons might disappear, but they would maybe disappear by decaying into other particles. Electrons and positrons have nowhere to go uh, if you preserve their charge. And we know there are no charged massless particles around today. However, the view I take here is that remember that in the early universe, the Higgs mechanism only comes in at some later stage here, and you have massless 
quantities uh, around this boundary. And I'm proposing, this is unconventional, but uh, not unreasonable, that mass in the very remote future will decay away according to a sort of inverse Higgs process. That, of course, is, is unconventional, but there is nothing in observation against it. It might be a very, very long time before this happens. Um, and there is some theoretical evidence that you might have something like this when you have a cosmological constant. The, uh, one of the ways that particles are characterized in particle physics is by looking at representations of the Poincaré group. And you see that the uh, rest mass is a Casimir operator. And so for a stable particle, it ought to be definitely a constant. But if you take the cosmological constant into consideration, you have basically the De Sitter group take, playing the role of the Poincaré group, and the rest mass is no longer a Casimir operator. So there is no real reason to believe that it should be constant for a stable particle. That's not a very strong argument, but it seems to me quite possibly that mass will decay away. And I'm going to assume here that that is the case. Not only that, that therefore you could use Elmer Friedrich's arguments to say there is a smooth future. You don't need to put any strong restrictions on. This joins then onto the Big Bang of the succeeding eons. So this is the picture that I have. The gluing that you take of one eon to the next is through the geometry here being conformal. There also are equations, which I shall, I don't know whether I have any time to describe these things, but I do want to say a few things quickly about that. Um, about, you see, you need really to have mathematical equations which describe this transition from one to the next. Now, uh, this gives us the picture that I had before with the eons uh, following each other. I have to find my other one to make that complete. Uh, here we are. So that is the, so the basis. It does give you, in order for this to be consistent, it does give you, I should say, not just as Paul Todd wanted, the, the, the vial curvature to be finite here, but the vial curvature is necessarily zero. The reason for that is that in the remote future, the vial curvature is necessarily zero. You can get from the equations, I'll vaguely describe that shortly. And that means because the conformal geometry is supposed to be smooth, it has to be zero in the next eon. So it gives you a very strong version of the vial curvature hypothesis, somewhat stronger than even what Paul Todd was suggesting, and that is the model. I should mention two points at the end. One is the question of the second law of thermodynamics. Since that started the whole discussion, you might worry, how can you have a second law with entropy increasing all the time when you have a cyclic model like this? Well, the answer to that, although it took me a while to realize what that answer must be, seems to me the answer must be that the black holes, when they disappear, according to Stephen Hawking originally, there is loss of information, or really technically loss of degrees of freedom in the black holes, and so that goes away. And if you lose degrees of freedom, that is a strange thing from the point of view of standard physics. It means, however, that, well, let me show you this picture here. This is meant to be a picture of phase space, and here we have, in standard physics, you don't have things like that, you have a phase space, and the evolution of the universe is described by a curve in phase space. But if, as part of the dynamics, you lose degrees of freedom, that means you squash your phase space down, and that means that you, as you lose degrees of freedom, you have to project this line down into the smaller space. Now, that is not something which happens in ordinary physics when degrees of freedom are not lost. But if but degrees of freedom are lost, and that was what Hawking originally said, as I believe is correct, then you have a picture of rather like the one I showed you. And that means that as the black holes evaporate away, then the, <coughs> the entropy has to be reset. It's not that the second law is ever violated. It's not violated. It is that your definition of entropy <coughs> changes. Because your definition of entropy, you use, let's say, a, a, I'm using a Boltzmann <coughs> definition, 
of entropy, and one has uh, Boltzmann definition uses the phase space coarse graining, and you look at the volumes of the phase spaces, and you have a logarithm here, and uh, the, the logarithm enables your uh, entropy to be additive, that's an important point. So that means when the degrees of freedom get lost, you subtract a big constant from the entropy. So there's no violation of the second law, it's just that you change your mind about what degrees of freedom are to contributing to your definition of entropy. So that the whole procedure is consistent with the second law, yet you have to renormalize the notion of entropy each time a black hole disappears. So it's, uh, it does make a consistent picture, whether it's consistent in full detail with the further calculations and so on. But you, what you find is that although the entropy is increasing all the time, um, in fact, the disappearance of black holes, according to the Hawking evaporation, is driven by the second law. It's not just consistent with the second law, it is completely driven by it. So that the second law is fundamental to all these processes. But then the disappearance of the phase space occurs in various stages in the late, not at crossover, but somewhat before it. The crossover itself, there is no entropy change at all. Okay, that's point one. Uh, the second point, and I think I probably had point one described it here, you can perhaps read that, but I've more or less said that. Point number two is the observational issue. I should perhaps, I don't know what should I do with time. It's, it's, we started a little late. Can I have a few minutes to describe the equations? Or? Еще, еще примерно 20 минут. Okay, well, let, let me briefly say something about the equations. Uh, and then I want to say something about the observations. Um, I'll put that one in there. The way you treat this situation is you have the prior, this is the crossover surface between one eon and the next. Prior to that, we have the previous eon, let's take this away for a moment, the previous eon with its metric, which I put a G with a circumflex. And post-crossover, we have a different metric, G with a upside-down circumflex. At crossover, I have a, a third metric, which joins the two, where I use a G myself. There is a conformal factor, which relates this metric to this one, another conformal factor, which relates it to this one. I use a capital omega for this connection, a, a, a small omega for this one, and I have a reciprocal hypothesis, is that one is minus one over the other. Here I have a, a useful quantity, which carries the information of the conformal factor smoothly across from one to the next, and so you can do your calculations in this crossover region. I have a, essentially a cosmological constant. This cosmological constant, or some people call dark energy, I just call it Einstein's cosmological constant. I demand that it's necessarily positive. This only works when it's positive, otherwise the surface for infinity would not be space-like. Uh, and I also... Convenience. This is just a convenience. There's no physics here. I say that I choose cosmological units. The speed of light is 1. Planck's constant is 2 pi. That's the standard thing. You reduce Planck's constant is 1. And the cosmological constant is 3. Now you might say, isn't that a big assumption? No, because I'm not saying that the, cos the gravitational constant has any particular value. That could be whatever comes about. You have to fix one or the other. I'm fixing the cosmological constant to be three. That's only because it has to be co positive for three years just to make the equations work nicely. And then I have another hypothesis, which I'm calling the delayed resonance hypothesis. I have this with a, an alternative, which I can give you. That's because I couldn't make up my mind which alternative to choose. This is the one I'm adopting at the moment, that you have an expansion for this quantity pi, defined explicitly here. It has this power series expansion, which uh, doesn't have any omega squared term. The one is forced, uh, the, and the Q is some universal constant. And that tells you that rest mass takes a little while to reappear. You see, rest mass has to be zero at the crossover. It comes back automatically. We think about the Higgs mechanism as introducing rest mass. In this scheme, you also have to have rest mass appearing. 
it would be a nice exercise to see whether you can connect this constant Q to the mass of the Higgs or whatever it is. That's not something I have done as yet, but one can tie this, this scheme in with, with standard uh, particle physics. Uh, I should make just a few points here. One is the way in which the conformal curvature behaves. You see uh, the vial curvature describes the conformal geometry, the conformal curvature, and it scales in a particular way according to the uh, conformal factor. However, there is another quantity which I call k, which is proportional to c, and it's the k which in vacuum satisfies a conformally invariant wave equation. So if you want to see what happens to gravitational waves, say, as they reach up to this crossover surface, you look at k. But then you want to know what the conformal curvature is, and you see one is related to the other by a conformal factor. And this is what gives you the c is zero crossover. I, I haven't time to go into the details here, but I just want to say that there are detailed calculations which tell you a lot of, about what happens here. One important thing is that the conformal factor, because of, the, because of this reciprocal hypothesis, the conformal factor initially is simply keeping track of what the prior metric was. It has no physical content. However, when you cross over, this new inverse conformal factor behaves like a physical field. It behaves like a self-coupled scalar field. Now, when mass starts to appear, appear, it's a self-coupled massive scalar field. And I hypothesize that that is the initial form of dark matter. So you have in this scheme not only a role for dark energy, if you like, the cosmological constant, but you also have an essential role for dark matter. That some mysterious new material has to come in which takes up the degrees of freedom in the gravitational field. I said that the vial curvature goes to zero, which says on the other side, that means you don't have gravitational degrees of freedom as such activated. But the equations tell you that this new, newly created material picks up the degrees of freedom in the gravitational waves and things like that in the previous eon and converts them into motions in the initial dark matter. The dark matter, incidentally, has to decay throughout the eon. There is some evidence, not terribly strong at the moment, that dark matter does decay. There are indications of signals from close to the center of our galaxy, which can be explained by a decay of dark matter. I would take the view that dark matter has to decay, and by the end of the eon, it's all gone. So it starts again with new dark matter, which has to be there because of the reciprocal, reciprocal hypothesis and the whole framework of the scheme, which converts the gravitational degrees of freedom into degrees of freedom in the initial dark matter. So those are things mainly which I think I want to say here. Um, this is just an equation to tell you that, uh, that you get what I was saying, basically. Originally, the conformal factor is a phantom field. It satisfies an equation like this. After the crossover, it becomes a real field, which I record is the initial form of dark matter, and you have an appearance of rest mass, which seems to be connected with the with the Higgs. Um, I've got this, in this transparency here, but uh, yeah, that, that is the trace of the energy momentum tensor, and you see it has to appear. Uh, the Q comes in here somewhere. Else. Never mind about the details of that. I think I want to end by just talking about the observations quickly. And they are, there are some striking new uh, information that we have here. Uh, <coughs> the picture that I have, you see, is there anything that we can see in this model that yeah, are implications of, of the model? Well. I had to think about what might be the most violent process that occurs in the eon prior to ours. If the eon prior to ours is like ours, then it will uh, indulge in certain activities. And the most violent one I can think of would be the collision between supermassive black holes. Our galaxy, as I said before, has a black hole of about 
four million solar masses. The Andromeda galaxy has a black hole which is even bigger. Now we are on a collision course with Andromeda, so I'm told, so that in I don't know how many thousands of millions of years we will collide with Andromeda. And it is possible that our black holes, probably not head-on collision, but they might capture each other, spiral around, and when they swallow each other up, there will be a violent emission of energy in the form of gravitational waves. A few percent of the total mass of those black holes combined, which will be something stupendous, on a scale, the sort of scale I'm talking about, virtually instantaneous. So this will be an impulsive emission of energy in the form of gravitational waves. So this is meant to be the eon prior to ours. That's our eon. This is us up here looking back to the microwave background, which is registered on the surface just above crossover here. And when these black holes within some galactic cluster swallow each other up, there will be an emission of energy in the form of gravitational waves, a very violent, instantaneous emission of energy. As it meets the crossover surface, this, according to the scheme, will be converted into slight motions in the initial dark matter, which we would see, I mean, it's because when, when, you, get when you get mass occurring, there will be an effect of viscosity, and this impulse will slow down to relatively small motions in the dark matter but this will show up in the <coughs> microwave background. Now here I have a, a picture of, a, say, a pond, and it's been raining, and each drop of rain causes a ripple. It's a good analogy to what you have here. And suppose the rain stops after a while, and then you look at the pond, and you just see ripples. But if you do a careful statistical analysis, you should be able to find out that it's the individual raindrops have caused these ripples. So I'm saying it's something similar here. These are the effectively individual raindrops, and these are the ripples that you see. Do we see any evidence of such ripples? Well, uh, I had some trouble getting people to look for these things for a while, and uh, I tried to get people in Princeton to have a look, and they did look, but as it turns out, not in a way which was very revealing. However, some years later, uh, Zahir Gerzajan, I got hold of him, and uh, he had a different way of looking for these ripples. His idea was to look for rings around which the variance is less than normal. So here we have lots of ripples, and some of them are warm, some are cool. The warm ones are for the more distant sources, because there the signal is coming towards us, and so the motion of the dark matter is in our direction. And so therefore there is a Doppler shift to cause them to be slightly warmer. The ripples coming from those nearby sources, relatively nearby, will be slightly cooler because they're going away from us. And so for any random circle in the sky, there will be ripples of both kinds. Some will be warmer, some cooler, and you'll have a variance coming from that. But if you had to take a ring which exactly finds one of these you're looking around a ring which is exactly one of these actual rings, so the theory says should be there, then there is an additional contribution from that ring itself, and because of nonlinear effects due to the fluid motions, you find that they reduce the variance. And this was the idea that Gerzajan had, and he started to look for such things. Well, initially he looked for them in a rather crude way, and lots of people objected and say, well, you haven't taken into account the, the normal things people do, the power spectrum and so on. Well, he had his reasons for doing it his way. Uh, but nowadays, in a, in a recent paper, I should say, we have a paper on this which was published just in the last few weeks in the European Physical Journal, PLUS. And that's appeared just at, about three or four weeks ago. And uh, the key argument we have there to try to show that the rings we find are genuine effects and not uh, purely spurious statistical effects is the following. What you do is you look, for the, look at the real sky and look for these low variance circles and you see how many you see. Then you look for slightly deformed circles. How do you do that? 
Well, you twist the real sky. So here I have a twist of the real sky. Here's the formula for it. It just twists it like that. And this changes circles into ellipses. So that if you search, look, if you search for circles in the twisted sky, that is completely equivalent for, to searching for elliptical shapes in the, uh, sorry, circles in the twisted sky is equivalent to looking for elliptical shapes in the real sky. So that's what we do, and we twist by various degrees, starting with no twist, and then with a slight twist, this value s is a measure of the twist, and the, when s is plus or minus 2, the ellipticity is something of the order of 1 or 2%. And we go right down to s equals 80, for which the ellipticity is about 2 to 1, so it's, the major axis is about twice the minor axis. Uh, I don't know whether the um, projections are, are working. Are they working? Do you know? <laughs> Can we see the pictures that I had on the memory stick? I would like to see them if they if they are available. What is the situation? <coughs> Anybody know? К сожалению, к сожалению, нет, потому что у нас не удается открыть. А, вот удалось, удалось. Thank you very much. <laughs> the top two pictures represent the true sky, where for I should explain another thing. We look for not just individual circles, but if you have a single cluster of galaxies, then there will be many galaxies which will collide from time to time. From time to time, their black holes will swallow each other up, and they will look like circles which are concentric, because that galactic cluster will converge on one point on the sky, and the circles will be centered about those points. So this is the analysis we look for here. At the top pair of pictures, we are looking at triples, at least three low-variant circles, with the low-variance being given by a specific degree of lowness. And we find 352, don't go too far, stop, 352 centers. And on the left at the top, you will see where the centers are. They're very crowded which in itself is rather extraordinary. I was puzzled by this at first. The immediate interpretation is that the universe in the previous eon was quite irregular. And this is perhaps not so surprising. We now know that there are concentrations of quasars in our own eon, which are very far from being uniform. So this is another indication that the universe is perhaps not as uniform as we had previously thought. Uh, well, now as you come down the picture, you see the larger and larger values of twist. The, the S is telling you how much twist. The first one, the numbers drop by more than a factor of three, and this is a twist for which there, there is only one or two percent a ratio of major to minor axis. When you go right down to the bottom, you see this is ellipses which really look elliptical. You can see over here, for example. Well, I don't know if you can see what I'm pointing at. But there is a, a ellipse up there. You can see how elliptical it is. When you go up to the top, they don't look elliptical at all. They look very circular. But they are elliptical. But when you get to the bottom, the 2 to 1 ellipses, the numbers drop to what you expect from a completely random sky. So completely random sky with the power spectrum within. So 16, 11, you see about 15 of them from a random sky. This is for three, at least three circles for the same center. Can we have the, 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 the next uh, piece? The next one, please, the, the other slide. Yeah. Yes, that's Now this is for four. Now we're looking at centers for at least four rings. And you see at the top, 56. We still see 56 of them. When you twist, so it's only about 1 or 2 percent ellipticity, they drop dramatically by a factor of about 4. If you go right down to the bottom, well, when you see a twist of, uh, well, the twist is even, uh, when the twist is a uh, uh, well, 10, say, so that one, yes. Um, not very elliptical yet. The numbers drop very dramatically. When the twist is 50 here, they disappear completely on the left. You do see two of them left on the right. They're probably only there because you see they're right on the edge. I should say that the strip in the middle is removed 
because there is contamination from the galactic plane, and we don't know what's going on there, but it means that the circles are cut off, and it's a bit hard to tell that they're not, they're not circles. So probably those twos and threes are, are, are if you can see the whole circle, they're probably too elliptical and you would lose them. But you lose everything altogether completely when the twist, so the ellipses are about two to one. So whatever this means, it is something which is not expected on conventional theory. For some reason, there is a preference for concentric sets of circles of low variance. Now, the scheme that I've been describing to you does predict this. This idea was put forward before these observations were done. So we, we, uh, I certainly expected to see the circles, and I expected to see them concentric. Vahe Gazajan had the low variance analysis rather than I was expecting lower, warmer ones. In fact, an <coughs> independent analysis by uh, some people in Warsaw, some Polish physicists, well, one is German, but they live in Poland, and uh, they have done a completely different type of analysis, and they confirm this time for single circles with 99.7% uh, um, uh, what you said, belief. 99.7% uh, uh, expectation. And I forget the f word you use in English now. <laughs> Never mind. Yeah, they're, they're, these are real rather than artifacts. And this is a completely independent way of doing it from what we do it. Our way is to compare. In, we use no simulations at all. We look at the true sky, and we see in the true sky there was a strong preference for concentric sets of circles, not of elliptical shapes. So you need, if it's a conventional <coughs> inflation explain, explanation, you need to, uh, to explain these things too. Uh, it's hard to see even how you get the very non-isotropic non distribution, because the standard explanation from, ex from inflation is that these come about from quantum fluctuations in the early universe, and these quantum fluctuations are then expanded by inflation, but they should be random. And so why do you see very clumpy distributions very far from random, even just before we start twisting the sky, you see them clumpy in a very extraordinary way. So it's telling us, I believe, information about an eon prior to the Big Bang, and it's not simply a mathematical scheme which may or may not have any relevance. We do seem to see some evidence for something which was predicted by the scheme. Perhaps there is a different explanation, which comes from more conventional ideas, but I have not yet seen any such explanation for these effects. Thank you very much. Yes, that's a very good question. Um, I used to believe, like most people, that to understand one good reason for studying quantum gravity was to explain the Big Bang. And so I'm a bit surprised when I come up with a scheme like this, which, in which you simply use classical equations to evolve from an eon prior to ours, the main effects, according to the scheme, would be purely classical. The only extension you need of standard Einstein general relativity is to be able to extend it so the conformal factors can be zero or infinity. And uh, that's a very mild extension of Einstein's theory. However, I have no doubt that in black hole singularities, <coughs> the geometry will have to be a quantum geometry of some sort. But you see, the view I would take about the Planck scale, which, yes, the arguments are very powerful, that something new should happen at the Planck scale, 
the view I take here with regard to singularities is that it's singularities in the vial curvature that are the ones that you have to treat with quantum gravity. The singularity in the scheme I have here is entire. the Big Bang singularity is entirely in the Ricci tensor. So you don't see any role according to the scheme for Planck geometry at the crossover. It's not a, a big role. There may be a role in, the, in, the, in direct role or something. But the role initially for describing the crossover from one eon to the next is entirely in terms of classical differential equations, which of course is, is, is shocking to people, even to myself, for some years ago, I would have been shocked by this, because it seemed to me, yes, we need a quantum gravity of some sort, even if it's a quantum theory, which is not the standard quantum theory, which is what I did believe, and still do believe, that quantum gravity has got to be a non-standard quantum mechanics, but yes, something funny happens at the Planck scale, but it's only at the Planck scale with regard to the conformal curvature which would be very dominant in the black holes. We certainly see this from the Kalatnikov uh, um, uh, analysis and from other considerations that there must be very wildly diverging and dominating vial curvature in those singularities. So the vial curvature completely dominates and yes, some crazy kind of geometry comes in there. And maybe the crazy geometry comes in indirectly in all sorts of other physics, but as for treating the Big Bang, the irony of this is that we don't seem to need it, which is which it would have puzzled me very much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you. Sorry, shall I ask? No, okay. so, yeah. all right, I think. Uh, what is considered as uh, one uh, of the main uh, successes of inflation is the uh, prediction of the power spectrum of small seeds of, uh, for the structures. Yeah, or fluctuations of the cosmic microwave background. So how this issue... Yes. There is some problem, yes. Don't you, don't you hear me? Sorry. Do you hear me? No, oh, I... She was... But you were speaking Russian. No, no. You were speaking Russian. You heard what I see. Yeah, maybe... No, she wants maybe... you to speak Russian. I think you have to uh, take off the... I can do it this yeah. way. Is it okay now? A молодой человек, себе микрофон, пожалуйста. Okay, so, so I was asking, uh, I was saying that the main success of inflation, what is believed to be the main success, one of the main success of inflation... Inflation, you say, sorry. Inflation, yes. Yeah. In the prediction of the seeds for the structures, right? Просим no. говорить микрофон. I think if I... Microphone, okay. Okay. Is, is it better like that? Okay. So, yeah. So how this issue is addressed in your, uh, in your, in your setup? Um, I hope I'm answering the question you asked, because I, I wasn't quite sure. But let me just say something. Okay. You're completely correct to say, if you were saying this, you're completely correct to say that inflation explains things that we need explanations for. In this scheme, we would also... For example, the near scale invariance of the fluctuation, which is an important feature, of course, going back to Zeldovich and, and, uh, and so on, but extended much more in modern observations. We see the scale invariance, not quite scale invariance, but nearly scale invariance, which is a feature of at least uh, many inflation models. It, and, but the essential ingredient of that, it seems to me, is the exponential expansion, because you have a self-similar model, and that self-similar model is likely to give you self-similar uh, fluctuations. But in my scheme, you also have that. Okay, there are deviations from self-similarity, but the physics that you're talking about is the cosmological constant dominates the geometry of the universe. So if you have a self-similar universe, the uh, closely distinct situation, as you have in inflation. But now it's in the remote future of the previous eon. You also have processes taking place which are also self-similar, like the gravitational dynamics. Now, one would have to see in detail whether that gives the kind of close to scale invariance that we see and which certain models of inflation do explain. So, yes, I completely agree that is the requirement of this model. I'm not an expert on many things you have to know about uh, remote uh, dynamics of galactic, galactic dynamics. How, how many black holes there are, how often they encounter, 
how much energy they emit, which is a quite subtle problem, because the analysis, you see, you're looking at energy in the form of gravitational waves. Now, the analysis for handling energy and gravitational waves, basically the von sachs analysis, very beautiful, is all an asymptotically flat space. That does not work here because you have asymptotically a completely different structure of infinity, which is space-like and not null. And that means you need to do it all over again. I tried for a while to do it all over again and I got distracted. I hope somebody, I have a student who may be looking at this now. But it's a, an interesting problem. How do you work out the energy in gravitational waves, how that converts itself to the, to the fluctuations that you see in the dark matter, and there are several bits of physics there which need to be addressed. So it's quite a complicated problem. The general idea that there's something scaling there and ought to be there is pretty clear. But whether in detail it matches what we see is a, is a problem, and it has to be done. It's just not been done yet. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Уважаемый сэр Рудер, здравствуйте. При статистической обработке данных измерений космического фонда имени Уилкинсона yeah. был получен ряд так называемых неожиданных результатов. В отчетах Гадардовского центра они никак не комментируются. Эти результаты, кратко я вам напомню, следующие. Геометрия наблюдаемой части Вселенной практически эвклидова. Вероятность согласия модели углового спектра на основе лямбда CD модель имеет низкую вероятность согласия. Порядка две сотых, в лучшем случае до семнадцати сотых. Просьба сформулировать вопрос, у нас мало времени. Вероятность согласия модели углового спектра на основе лямбда CD модели. С данными измерений. И еще один очень важный результат, который в отчетах назван дегенерацией модели. И, и этот, эта дегенерация связана как раз с параметрами темной материи, барионной материи и темной энергии. Не могли бы вы прокомментировать эти результаты? Спасибо. For the low multiple values, you see the curve does not fit the expectations. I wanted to make sure I'm, I'm addressing the question. Yeah. Now, I agree, there are <laughs> strong puzzles which are not explained by the conventional uh, lambda uh, LCDM model. Now, uh, of course, in this scheme, we just have to take what we're given. So, the thing is, we're not so constrained to say that the initial fluctuations were random. And we look it up, I look at my pictures and I say, whoops, they're not random. <laughs> and I then say, well, they're not random because the previous eon was not random. That's not really an explanation, but it's consistent with the scheme. So, in a sense, we just see what we get, and we have to, and it's like we're looking out in our eon and seeing we see distributions of mass which seem to be very 
strongly deviant from the, from the uniformity. And so here we see even stronger in the previous year big distributions of sources which are not uniform over the sky. Now it's not so much of a problem for me because I don't say the initial fluctuations are random quantum events as inflationists would say. But I say yes, I don't know, we see what we see and that's what it is. So I think I have more hope <laughs> to find explanations. And I agree that these are anomalous and they are ignored. Yes. I haven't looked in detail at those, but they look very interesting. And they do seem to be anomalous, as you say. And uh, I'm not in a position to comment, I'm afraid, at the moment. I only just saw the pictures before coming to Russia. And uh, it, it would be very interesting to see. The one thing I can say is there doesn't seem to be any much change about the circles. I had a very preliminary communication from Gozajan, and he says, he just looked at some of them and said, well, the shapes are very similar, maybe more precise before, but you still seem to see the same effects. What is the opinion about Einstein Cartan theory? <laughs> well, yes. Well, this is an extension of Einstein's theory where you have torsion, uh, where the torsion in the connection comes about from uh, the, the, the spin density of material. I've been, always been in two minds about that theory. Uh, sometimes I've played with it and sometimes I've ignored it. <laughs> I think it is the most interesting deviation from standard Einstein theory. Whether it has a, a, a real role to play or whether you can explain in terms of standard Einstein theory the effects of spinning material, I don't know. I think I have to say my response to this is a question mark. I think it is well worth studying. I'm not convinced yet that, that it's the right thing to do. It has some difficulties in some respects, but as I said before, I think it's the most, most plausible of the modifications of Einstein's theory. Yes. Thank you a zillion times for your interesting talk. Uh, my question is about uh, fundamental physical uh, properties and constants. Uh, the newly created eons or universe, uh, does it inherit uh, the physical properties and constants from the previous one? And then, uh, moreover, <clears throat> uh, what is your opinion? The physical constants are sign of valued and uh, determined by mathematical laws and symmetries, or uh, their origin is, uh, uh, let's say, by chance? Well, there are several responses I would make to this question about the constants of nature, uh, they need explaining. Now, my emotionally most satisfying answer would be a mathematical explanation, that all these numbers are numbers you could calculate mathematically, and that knowing those numbers we would see why uh, life takes one form or another, or why it's here, or so on. There are, it, I'm not convinced by the arguments where people say these coincidences tells us that they must be said by God or they must be, uh, there are many other universes and we are only in the one where the numbers have the right value. Uh, I find that an uncomfortable form of reasoning. Um, so I'm not happy with it. There is, however, new, there are new ingredients with this scheme, which is interesting. For one point, there is an observational you see, you might say, are they, do the eons have the same values of these constants? Now, it's conceivable that they might be different each time. 
And it's the sort of thing Wheeler used to consider, that maybe you have a universe which oscillates, and each time the numbers come out different. Now, that is a good and a bad side to that. It's bad because we don't know what to do if the numbers are different. But it's good because if the numbers seem to be consistent, to be the same, that is evidence that they do not change. Now, there is a tiny piece of evidence that they do not change. It's only very tiny, but let me tell you what it is. You can, on the basis of this model, you can estimate, supposing that big, big black holes only start to collide at a certain stage in, in time. Now, suppose that was about now. I think it's probably likely to be earlier, actually, because we see some galaxies with two black holes in their centers, and they will collide, maybe some of them, a long time before now. But let's say now. And then you have to say, in the conformal diagram, you draw the diagram, according to my colleagues' estimates, we are about three quarters of the way up the diagram. Now this means that if in the previous eon, the encounters only occurred to in what was now in that eon, then the maximum size of the circles you would see for these <coughs> collisions would be uh, roughly 40 degrees in diameter, something like that. Now we see some of about 30 degrees. The 40 degrees one would be very unlikely. You might see a few of them. It's consistent with the numbers not changing. If the numbers were very different in the previous eon, very different, it might be a completely different number for the cutoff. But that number seems to be pretty consistent with what it was in our eon. So that's a tiny evidence, maybe, that the, that number, at least, whatever it comes from, did not change. Now, one would hope that as observations get more and more refined, one could use this argument in a stronger way, which seems to me to be optimistic. There's a second point, which is that the questions are slightly different in this scheme. Like with the old steady state model, what you're looking for is a system which propagates itself. So you might say that maybe with different values of the constants, it would not propagate itself. And only with certain values do you get a universe which continues eon after eon. And so that's a, a, a slightly different ingredient into the discussion. So I, I, I like these arguments in the sense that I like to play with them. I'm not sure how much I believe of the results I see from these things, but that's the second point. Thank you. Уважаемые коллеги, я, к сожалению, вынужден завершить нашу часть встречи, связанную с вопросами, и хотел бы предоставить слово первому проректору по учебной работе Падалкину Борису Васильевичу. Разрешите поблагодарить вас за внимание, которое вы уделили нашему университету. Мне кажется, что все гости получили огромное удовольствие, услышав вашу лекцию. И разрешите вручить вам сувенир на память о пребывании в Московском государственном техническом университете имени Баумана.
хотел бы поблагодарить сэра Роджера Пенроуза за очень интересное выступление, которое мы выслушали. Поблагодарить всех присутствующих, которые нашли возможность приехать, задать вопрос. Я понимаю, что времени, к сожалению, очень мало. Не, на все, не все вопросы удалось задать. Но, тем не менее, я думаю, что для всех присутствующих те две встречи, которые прошли в стенах нашего университета, останутся на толку и память. Огромное спасибо всем. И еще раз давайте поблагодарим профессора.